So uh, scrapbooks are journals of memories, um, a gateway into the lives of their creators. They contain seemingly mundane materials, but upon closer inspection, those materials come together to tell specific nuanced stories. The Patricia Kay and Ralph L. DeRoy papers and photographs is a collection of 18 scrapbooks created by Patricia K. DeRoy. The scrapbooks cover more than a century of history, beginning in 1890 and ending in 1996. Patricia saved mementos from her daily life, family vacations, business trips, everyday accomplishments, and momentous occasions in her life and the lives of her family and friends. Seen together on page after page, these objects give a vivid picture of the texture and tone of middle-class Jewish family life in the Pittsburgh area throughout the middle decades of the 20th century. The story begins in a very large and very fragile scrap scrapbook titled Patricia and Ralph DeRoy, Volume 1. On the following slides, you'll notice just how fragile the pages are, which is why this particular scrapbook is accessible only through digital copies. It provides a deep dive into the respective families of the two individuals. Each chapter contains a myriad of family photographs, letters, newspaper clippings, family trees, birth certificates, and marriage licenses. Each item is affixed with a brief description that further explains the connection of each individual or event. As I carefully flipped through the pages of this album, wanting to absorb as much information as I possibly could, I found that Patricia, or Pat as her close family and friends called her, painstakingly pieced together a detailed chronicle of the Goldstons, the Weinbergs, the Coens, the Kreimers, the DeRoys, Ralph, and herself through seven chapters. I was transported back in time, if only for a moment. I was there when Pat's grandparents, Clara Goldston and Louis Weinberg, wed at the Borough Hall located in Stockton on Tees in the County of Durham, England, on January 8th, 1903. I imagine being there as they signed their ketubah. I could feel the tension in a letter written by Eli Goldston to his daughter, Clara, on October 20th, 1916, upon his arrival back in his home country, England. Goldston wrote to his daughter from a war-torn Europe during World War during oh excuse me World War One. The beginning of the letter reads, "Dear Clara, in reply to your desire that I should write, I am writing you to you. I am letting you know in short words. I cannot write a great deal as we are not allowed. It is a lucky job that I have come back in time to England. As for regarding for Lewis and you to come back, you must not think about it. It cannot be done, not at present time." I watched as Mildred, the Weinberg's daughter, grew from a 12-day-old infant to the wife of Isidore B. Kreiner and a mother to Pat. There is a picture for every year of Mildred's life in the Weinberg chapter, and those pictures continue to flow into the Kreimer chapter. Mildred Weinberg married Isidore Kreimer on January 27, 1924. Isidore Kreimer served in the U.S. Army in the 80th Infantry Division during World War I which was a division that originally consisted of men mostly from Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. The pages dedicated to his service contain official correspondence, orders, newspaper clippings, and the unit's distinctive insignia. Here you'll see Crimer's insignia, which is at the top right-hand corner of the second page, which consists of three blue mountain peaks representing the Blue Ridge Mountains in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. I was able to envision Royal Credit Clothing Company, Crimer store located on Liberty Avenue in downtown Pittsburgh, where customers could buy clothing on credit. Pat saved his business cards, checks, and credit book, unaware of the intrinsic value that these things hold today. She captured the success of a Russian Jewish immigrant in Pittsburgh for future generations. Patricia Iris Crimer was born to Mildred and Isidore Crimer in 1925. As is the tradition among those who grew up in and around Square Hill, Pat graduated from Taylor Alderdice High School in 1942. Pat didn't leave herself off the record, offering glimpses into her interests and activities as a young adult. She documented major milestones like receiving her confirmation at Road of Shalom Congregation in 1941, playing the cello, and her graduation from the University of Pittsburgh in 1946. Pat began chronicling her own adventures as a young adult, something that she continued to do throughout her life. She had her finger on the archival pulse. 
And now at this time, I would like to go on a journey over to the live dot camera. Where you'll see a page from the, the Patricia Primer chapter in this, uh, the scrapbook that I've been describing to you. This is a page that is decorated with photograph after photograph of Pat herself throughout her childhood, photographs that show her holding her dog, uh, playing with childhood friends, with other family members. She put such great detail into these pages. She even included her own lock of hair, or rather a tuft of hair, um, as it isn't very small. Um, and it's something that presumably her mother had saved for her and something that she had held on, held on to for decades and decades because it meant, so, it meant to be so special for her. All right, and now we're gonna head back over to the PowerPoint. While Pat provides photographic documentation of her self scrapbooking, there isn't a definitive answer as to why she dedicated so much of her time to it. It's clear that she greatly enjoyed it, but I can't help but wonder why she enjoyed it so much. It plays into the idea that humans have had this innate need or want to self-document and to record events. We see the beginnings of record keeping and prehistoric cave drawings that tell stories of hunting or serve as warnings to others. The creators behind such drawings couldn't have been aware that they would someday serve as a historical marker, just as Pat couldn't have ever predicted that her scrapbooks would become special pieces of great historical value. Using photographs, business documents, and correspondence, Pat pieced together the history of Joseph DeRoy and Sons, the well-known downtown jewelry store run by her husband, Ralph DeRoy, and his family. Her scrapbook pages show how a small pawnbroking business started by an immigrant Jewish family from in Amsterdam evolved into a series of downtown jewelry stores operated by branches of a growing family. She also laid the genealogical framework of one of the oldest Jewish families in Pittsburgh. The DeRoy family immigrated to Pittsburgh in the 1850s before finding success as pawnbrokers. Joseph DeRoy, along with his brother Israel DeRoy, founded DeRoy and Sons, a pawnbroking and jewelry business at 49 Smithfield Street in downtown. The brothers eventually parted ways and opened separate jewelry stores downtown, Joseph DeRoy and Sons and Israel DeRoy and Sons. Pat begins the DeRoy chapter with an assortment of photographs that illustrate the people and places that created her husband, Ralph. She collected materials that preceded her life in an effort to explain his. The photographs first introduced the original DeRoy Brothers store and then Joseph DeRoy and Sons owned by Ralph's grandfather before presenting Ralph's parents, Al DeRoy and Edna Lyons DeRoy. She provides page after page of a family devoted to their relationships, their business and the Jewish community. In memory of their parents, Joseph and Lydia DeRoy, brothers Abraham, Al, Louis, and Isaac DeRoy donated property to the Gusky Orphanage, a Jewish orphanage on the north side, to erect a residence building. Certificates document the purchase of seats at Road of Shalom Congregation by Al and Edna DeRoy in 1909. Joseph and Lydia DeRoy belonged to Tree of Life, where he purchased a seat for $100 in 1884. Their ties to the community ran deep. Photographs offer a glimpse into the store as it transitioned into a new century and into a modern streamlined business in the 1950s. Like his father and his father before him, Ralph joined the family business, eventually taking over. The remaining pages capture not just major milestones in Ralph's life, but the smaller tender moments. In photographs, Ralph is often accompanied by his parents, other family members, or his beloved dogs. He was afforded many opportunities like traveling to South America, California, and studying business administration at the Babson Institute in Massachusetts after serving in World War II. It was during his service that Ralph met Pat. The couple wed on October 2nd, 1944. The 17 scrapbooks that follow capture their lives together. Pat centered her life around her family, something that she vividly captures in her albums beginning in 1954 and ending in 1996. Each one offers a unique glimpse into birthdays, anniversaries, vacations, and small moments shared by the family with materials that range from matchbook covers, napkins, photographs, correspondence, and candles. Some of them have been removed from their binding, refolded, and placed into archival boxes for preservation purposes, while others have been kept in their binding and placed into archival boxes. 
While the housing of the scrapbooks varied, one thing remained consistent. The items on each page were left in their original ornament, meaning they were kept right where Pat had wanted them. Removing just one image or piece of ephemera would have interrupted the narrative. The DeRoys had two children, Al in 1948 and Diane in 1953. A candle placed next to a card represents Diane's first birthday, a major milestone for any child. Pat chronicles her children's Jewish education, saving Al's Road of Shalom religious school report cards and photographs of Diane at the Hebrew Institute summer camp. This photograph also keeps record of an institution that has since ceased to exist in our city. Many of the items in these scrapbooks serve as a conduit to Pittsburgh Jewish history and the DeRoy family history. A constant theme that runs through each of the scrapbooks is the family's shared love for animals. Many photographs and even Al's schoolwork document their many pets. Later scrapbooks are filled with images of Pat's cats and her three Pekingese. Her beloved dogs are often depicted sitting in the laps of Ralph and Pat with their pedigrees affixed to nearby pages. I would like for us now to journey back over to the live doc cam. Here you'll see one of the dense scrapbooks that I have kept in the binding um, for beauty purposes. Um, you'll see Pat and Ralph holding onto their new Pekingese star. Um, you'll see her pedigree, which is um, affixed right next to it. And star actually came from down south. Um, I'm Kentucky to be specific. Um, so Pat took a, quite the journey to go get her, um, but that was okay because Pat greatly enjoyed her, her pets as we all know. Um, and I just wanted to show you how dense and how detailed these scrapbooks were um, and how beautiful they are in, in the, the research that they offer. Okay, so let's return. Ralph and, Ralph and Pat were able to give their children a life filled with adventure and opportunity as a result of the success of Joseph DeRoy and Sons, the store that Ralph had take, since taken over. He oversaw the building of a new and modernized store at 408 Smithfield Street in 1957 and became a certified gemologist, which is documented in the first scrapbook. Their comfortable life seemed to remain the same, even after the store closed its doors in 1963 and Ralph began selling life insurance with Phoenix Mutual. The DeRoys sent Al to Deer Creek Day Camp and then to Camp Linwood, an overnight camp in Stewartstown, West Virginia, where he would write regular letters to his parents, sharing his activities. Pat collected in real time, creating her own archival collection. The DeRoys traveled often and all over the country. Each time they went to a new city, Pat brought back a piece of each one with her. While Ralph was still in the jewelry business, they traveled to jewelry conventions held in New York, Chicago, and even Pittsburgh. Pat saved their name tags from the American National Retail Jewelers Association's 50th convention and trade show in New York City in 1954. While in the city, they had cocktails with Harry Winston at his house. Pat made sure to save the embroidered napkin that was served with those drinks. She needed to remember that moment. These items are proof that Joseph DeRoyne's sons had a reach that extended much further than Pittsburgh. The store actively participated in the broader jewelers community. The couple also enjoyed fine dining while they were at their conventions, which Pat documented with matchbook covers. Matchbooks at restaurants are an item of the past. It's something we just don't see anymore. Conventions only made up a fraction of the places that DeRoy's visited. The family enjoyed the beach in Atlantic City. They visited tourist attractions in Hollywood and they traveled to Hawaii several times visiting family. Pat never traveled without a camera. She had one readily available to capture Ralph Al, Diane, and herself as they took on new adventures in places far away from Pittsburgh. She even saved a pack of pure cane sugar from one of their trips to Hawaii. After the children moved out, Pat and Ralph traveled overseas to Africa and England in the 1970s and 80s. The DeRoys supported their children in each of their endeavors and were proud of their achievements. She saved just about anything she could that attested to both Al and Diane's success. She saved programs from Diane's school plays at Churchill Area High School and her report cards from Northwestern University and even her application for student teaching. She had a camera with her at Al's graduation from Franklin and Marshall College. She even captured his freshman dorm room, wanting to hang on to that moment for a little while longer. Pat held on to his application to medical schools and PhD programs along with his resumes throughout the years. She always had 
kept a tab on what her children were doing, something that extended to her grandchildren. While Pat kept records of the joyous occasions, she also kept record, kept note of the sorrowful. She dedicated pages to her mother Mildred's passing in 1985. The loss can be felt in the placement of the obituary alongside Mildred's photograph. Pat included the list of those who sent condolences, a testament to the love that people had for her mother. She wasn't just documenting her family. She was documenting her emotions as they happened in real time. Empty nesters Pat and Ralph moved to Florida in 1973 before returning to Pittsburgh in 1994 where they spent the remainder of their lives. Upon their return, they were welcomed back to Road of Shalom Congregation by Rabbi Mark Stateman. As the years went on and her children created their own paths in life, her scrapbooks became smaller. The once dense albums soon became light photo albums. But even as she aged, Pat still kept a record of her family, even if it wasn't as detailed as it once was. While Pat intentionally preserved family moments as keepsakes, she also unintentionally told the story of one of the oldest Jewish families in the Pittsburgh region. Thank you.